Good morning, it's Paul Clegg here, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Elaine Hutchinson from Creating Calm. I've known Elaine for some time, and I, I think you'll be fascinated with what she has to say about the work she does, because it's quite unusual. It's not what I would consider mainstream, but you may uh, argue with that, uh, Elaine. Tell me a little bit more about what Creating Calm is all about. Hi Paul, it's great to be talking with you this morning. Um, yeah, Creating Calm is a company that I set up quite recently. I am a child and adolescent therapist, so I work with children, teens and young people to manage big feelings, stressful situations and other life challenges that get thrown at them. Um, and I also work supporting the families and the um, other key adults around them. I would imagine right now creating calm is something that the whole of the nation, in fact, most of the world needs because everybody seems to be in a very stressful situation with the coronavirus. I think so. I mean, if you listen to parents talking about anxieties about homeschooling, anxieties about children returning to school, then the issues for them are key. And the issues are huge for children as well. You know, they're not seeing their friends. A lot of them are missing out on key endings for them. You know, end of sc school years, school plays, uh, goodbyes as they transition from one school to another. But the losses around the pandemic are huge. Key losses with children are classed as adverse childhood experiences or ACEs and this was started a few years ago in the States. Um, there's now been a study in the UK as well and this covers all sorts of things um, from divorce, bereavement, uh, moving house, all sorts of issues that are considered to be key interruptions to a child's um, life. And actually the coronavirus pandemic has been included as one of those now. So that is actually very significant for children in terms of mental health and general wellbeing. Very often as parents, we don't know whether we're doing the right thing. And right now there's the argument as to whether children should be sent back to school or not. What's your feeling on that? I think, Parents know their children very well. They also know themselves and their situation very well, and they have to make the decision that's, that's right for them. Um, I used to be a teacher. Teachers have amazing superpowers, and one of the things they are really, really good at is catching up kids who are lagging behind educationally. And I think this is the time to perhaps put um, the people work in front of the paperwork as somebody once said to me, so that looking after people's well-being, parents, children, everybody's, should in a lot of regards come ahead of worrying about academic prowess because that can always be caught up. You know, yes, mm. there's a gap, yes, there's an interruption, but it's not insurmountable for most children. Um, the big issue, I think, as a therapist is the social interaction and the feelings of safety surrounding what's going on for those those children and the parents because if the parents are anxious that's going to rub off on the kids i have a uh two grandchildren of uh three and seven and i know some of the trials and tribulations my uh son and his partner have gone through in in handling the whole schooling the stresses etc but at least those two children have had each other you should imagine it's even more difficult for children on their own who have probably lost contact with all of their pals and friends what sort of challenges do you think they might face going back to school i think it's going to be incredibly hard for them it's been incredibly hard as adults going out into the world and even just, you know, popping to, to the shops and, and seeing the changes there and, you know, having to queue two metres apart and all of this sort of thing, people in masks. There's been a huge adjustment as adults and children will have to replicate that adjustment. And school for a lot of them is a massive source of safety. It's familiar. You know, they know their friends, they know their teachers, they know the routines, they know the building. And all of that's going to have changed. The classes are going to be smaller. 
So key friends might not be there. Um, key staff might not be there because staff might be rotating through still. Um, the whole environment will have changed and that's going to be a massive adjustment for any children going back into school, however old they are. And they, some will need more support with that than others. You know, um, a lot of children who have support at home will manage it well, um, but not every child has support from parents. Where do people get to turn to you? When when do they? What do they see? What do they, what happens that triggers a call to you? Um, often it's that the child is is being different. So they may be very quiet. They may be quite withdrawn. They may be going the other way and exhibiting behaviours that the parents really don't like. You may have an angry, cross frustrated child or you may have a child that's exhibiting behaviors that really really worry you they may be harming themselves they may be choosing not to eat they may be indulging in really risky behaviors if you've got teens it may be that you know drug uh, there are drug issues there are issues around friendship all sorts of things but parents generally are pretty good at knowing when their child's not behaving normally for that child and sometimes that's picked up by parents who then ask for help and end up coming to me. Um, sometimes it's the schools that pick it up. I mean, at the moment I'm working through schools. So schools refer students to me to, to be seen. And then I meet with the parents and work with them. But also I have parents coming to me and saying, you know, can you, can you help my child? We've talked a, a little while about uh, primary school children, uh, but you mentioned earlier that you also deal with adolescents. What age range do you actually deal with? Do you help? I support children aged roughly three to 18. But if I'm working with the Play model, which is a model of play therapy designed to support students with uh, autism spectrum diagnosis or ASD, then often I work with students who are a bit older. Um, educators are great at using phrases like age, not stage, um, when it comes to looking at uh, children and their needs. And so as a therapist, we tend to look the other way around. We tend to look at where the student is um, and what they need on an individual basis, rather than just going, well, they're 17, so they should be doing this. When you say that you work, and I've heard you mention this before, with play, I mean, how do you work? Do, you know, I certainly lying on a couch. How does it all work? So if you wanted to um, imagine a typical session, your, um, your child or your young person would come in to my room and it's set up with loads of activities that they can engage with. So we use clay, we use um, creative materials, we use puppets, we use musical instruments, we use construction kit. I've got Lego so it comes out my ears. Um, we use loads and loads of miniatures and often they're put in a sand tray. A sand tray therapy actually is an adult therapy as well and we can do that with adults too. But that allows children to, to show me things rather than talk. So play therapy uses a child's inclination to play to support them in working through their issues rather than sitting and talking because as you'll know with grandchildren kids when they're having a hard time they don't say you know granddad i'm having a really hard time with freddie in class they'll say granddad play with me um and they will show you what they need to show you through play so as play therapists we're trained to watch and notice we actually um talk very little in a session generally which I think if you know me, you'll find that quite funny. Um, <laughs> and we, we watch and we notice. So the entire session is child led. So they can play or not as they choose. They can um, engage with whatever activity they feel like engaging in. They can talk to us. They can not talk to us. They can lie on the floor. 
and just have a nap. They can, you know, build a fort. They can blow bubbles. They can do all of it. Um, and we find as therapists, it's really interesting seeing the patterns and the behaviours that we see in the playroom. And we're trained to notice and to analyse and to see where that child's at with whatever the issue is and notice them move on. And if they don't move on, we support them in, in doing that. So we might notice a particular behaviour or we might wonder why they are doing something and just call those behaviours to their attention. So the entire therapy from start to finish is, is totally child led and it works. Um, Virginia Axeline, who pioneered play therapy back at the beginning of um, the 1900s, said that you know within everybody is the power to um, heal yourself. And mm -hmm. that's kind of one of the premises that we work to is that the best person to support you in your challenges is you. So we're there to facilitate that. We don't fix, that's not our job. Um, we support and guide. So if a, a parent is, is aware of a particular challenge, that parent then has got to make a decision as to what to do. And obviously the, the teacher may, may have a course of action they're doing at school and say, look, we're, we're gonna be doing this. Will you please enforce this at home? But if that's not working, uh, obviously then that's the time to come to you or should they come to you earlier? In my experience, the sooner that a child comes for help, the shorter term the therapy is. So if so, that could be a good trigger point, couldn't it? That that if a if a if a teacher has has brought about a particular behaviour, maybe a disruptive behaviour mm -hmm. or a a, a behaviour that's holding that child back from moving on. Uh, yeah. So much so that they call the parents uh, in, or maybe it's a discussion at a parent-teacher uh, evening. Yeah. Then, if it's an issue they're going to work on together, it could be a good time to call you, so that you've got almost a team effort. You, they, you, you know, you're providing that professional support, uh, not necessarily contradicting what the teacher is trying to do, but you know, supporting the parent more than anything. Absolutely. I mean, te teamwork is the best way to go with this. And actually, the biggest successes come when the adults involved in the child's life are working in the same direction. And it can be really useful if you are working privately with parents who have referred their child to you to work with the school as well. And equally, if you've been called in with the, by the school, it's absolutely vital to be working with the parents too. So everybody knows what's going on um, and everybody can work in the same way because there's lots of therapeutic skills that we use in the playroom that a parent can use for playing with their child or a teacher can use in the classroom. So some of the things I do outside of working with children is supporting parents and also um, supporting schools and teachers with using the therapeutic skills in their work. So I suppose your background as a teacher, working with schools at the moment, working with parents, it just gives you a well-rounded approach and there's probably not many challenges you haven't already met. Well, 30 years of teaching, you kind of face most of them, generally speaking. <laughs> um, one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, you about earlier, I'm only beginning to learn about, is the whole subject of mental health. I have grown up in an age where mental health was, was not quite the same. We didn't look at mental health the same way as we do now. I think yeah. we just had Mental Health Week. Uh, I realize that nowadays people are living more, far more stressful lives than I remember I ever did. What is mental health? It's a good question, actually. Um, everybody has mental health. It's not just people who are struggling. 
Um, and it's really important that just like we all look after our physical health, um, that we look after our mental health as well. So it's not just when people say mental health, they tend to mean people who are having a hard time. But actually, it's really important that those of us who are not having a hard time also continue to look after our mental health. It's like a bit mental well-being. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great yeah, so it's not, it's, not, it's not just about depression or uh, suicidal thoughts. Or, or what it could be yeah. anger, anxiety, fear. It's all the emotional sides. Is that, am I right? For me, I see a massive range of presenting issues for the children that I work with. So uh, if, you, if you go from one end of the continuum to the other, I can work with students who are having trouble in the playground or are having trouble transitioning from one, from one class to another. Um, I can be working with children who are just sad not depressed, just just sad. Um, I can be working with children who are having a bit of a tough time because families are breaking up or families are blending and they're having a hard time settling down. Right through all the things you can possibly imagine, all the way to the far end where the big dramas are. So um, trauma, significant trauma, uh, bereavement, um, all the things that the courts write about and have to deal with. Um, yeah, it, the, the spread is massive. And one of the things that I think parents find the hardest is that when they decide to get help, quite often if they're going through um, CAMS, that the wait times are extremely long and the help that they get is very, very limited. Um, I looked up the wait times for CAMS in the Southwest some time ago, and the length, I couldn't quote it to you right now, but the length of time surprised me. CAMS is Children and Adolescent Mental Health Services. So it is the support that the NHS offer uh, children, adolescents and their families around the sorts of issues that I'm working with. Accessing mental health support through your GP can be very long and very arduous. It's, it's weeks, if not months. Um, children are often limited to sort of six or eight sessions. It's often talking therapy, which is, as we've said, not ideal for children because emotional language is not something that they have particularly um, if they are younger. I've probably talked a little bit too much about primary school children because of the, your word of play therapy. I imagine children of that age play, but as you get more, as you get older, I don't imagine the two together. But when we reach adolescent and I look at the challenges that kids today have at secondary school, particularly with social media, with the fakeness of it all, with Instagram filters, so that everybody has to look absolutely perfect and everybody has to have so many likes. Do you, are you finding you're having to deal with a number of those issues? Absolutely. Um, social media has its place um, and can be absolutely wonderful, as many of us will attest to, having been through lockdown. Um, but I think the trouble with life now particularly online is it is a 24 7 event mm -hmm. you know when when you and i were growing up once you came away from school um it was done you know unless somebody rang the house phone to talk to you you didn't know what your mates were doing you didn't know what they were saying about you i mean you could imagine but you actually had a physical and mental break from it or Whereas as now it you know it can be absolutely incessant, and although a lot of children and teens have benefited hugely from social media during lockdown in that they can you know they can see friends, they can talk to friends, you know there's collaborative things going on, a lot of schools are being great about organizing things. 
so the distance has been narrowed for them and that's an, i think been an absolute blessing for many of them um there is this issue that if things are not great you can't get away from it parent is watching this at the moment they've tried various things with helping the child work through whatever um or they've just met with the teacher and realized they've got an issue that maybe they don't feel qualified to handle would it be okay for them just to give you a call without making any commitment just to find out a little bit more do you do, you do that do you, do you do any consultancy on that basis absolutely i mean please you know just drop me an email or pick up the phone i'm more than happy to chat um and just talk things through with you because as a parent, there's a massive source of anxiety when your child's unhappy. You know, you 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 want to make the child feel better as quickly as possible. But often, you know, as, as I found um, when I was was the parent looking for help, um, it, it you don't know where to start. You don't know who to go to. Um, you don't know whether it's for you and your child. Just please, just pick up the phone and let's have a chat. Trying to understand why people are behaving in the way that they are, uh, I find fascinating. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you this morning. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You.